What a, what a great introduction. Uh, thank you, it's, it's great to be here. Um, about seven, eight years ago, I co-founded a company that pioneered the 3D printing of human tissue uh, to be used for medical applications, medical research uh, specifically. And this company, Organovo, is based in San Diego, um, and it uh, enables pharmaceutical companies to test and develop new drugs faster by using real human tissues. And in the future, this technology uh, could allow patients to have uh, uh, transplant organs uh, grown for them. That's, that's the direction in which this technology is headed in. So that was then. Um, the company has grown since. It's now a public company based in San Diego. That was then. Um, today, I'm obsessed about leather for handbags and, uh, and meat uh, for making foods and snacks. And, and let me tell you, what I'm doing today may well be more important. And let me, let me, let me uh, to illustrate this, let me ask how many people in this room, raise your hands, uh, have eaten meat in the last couple of days? Raise your hands. There you go. Good, good. Uh, how many people currently in this room are wearing leather? Raise your hands if you're wearing leather. There you go. Exactly. You guys are the target market. So what we're doing at Modern Meadow is we're biofabricating leather and meat uh, to be able to make these things better and more efficiently. And the reason why this is a problem is that a lot of people like to eat meat, a lot of people wear leather, and in fact, we have a huge global dependence on animal products. We, you know, and, and livestock on a global scale is a huge, huge resource drain. In fact, today in the world, we have seven billion people, and we rely on farming 60 billion animals, land animals, that are a huge user of land, water, and a big emitter of greenhouse gases. Uh, by many calculations, the leading emitter of, of, uh, of, of greenhouse gases that cause climate change. And that's today. And, if, and over the next few decades, as the global population grows, um, and as uh, wealth around the world grows and consumption grows, uh, there is expected to be a near doubling of the demand for animal products. So if today livestock is the leading user of land, water, and you know, contributor of greenhouse gases, how do you double those numbers? How do you balance that equation? In reality, you can't. You need to rethink how these systems work. And uh, there's huge opportunities here. It goes without saying that meat is a huge global market uh, on the order of about a trillion dollars. And, uh, and so is leather. Leather is large as well. It's uh, in excess of 60 billion. And what's really interesting is that over the last five years, there's been a huge growth uh, in, 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 um, in the cost of these underlying commodities. And not just a huge growth in the cost, but a, a huge amount of volatility. So if you depend on these inputs for the products you make, that volatility is, um, is, is very painful. And these, this growth in prices, of course, is driven by things like droughts and disease outbreaks and all kinds of supply-demand dynamics that affect our agricultural systems. And what's interesting is that despite the fact that there's been a huge growth in the amount of consumption in these animal products globally, the gains in, in uh, the improvements in the supply have been incremental. If you think about it, the way we farm our livestock today is not fundamentally different than the way we did it 50 years ago. Sure, there's been incremental gains in automation and, and, and whatnot, but fundamentally, the way you grow your cow today is the way you would grow your cow you know, back in the, in the 40s and 50s. And so what if you could fundamentally rethink this? Rather than working subtractively, raising an entire animal uh, over the course of many years, all the care and feeding, all the waste that it involves, all the inefficiency, uh, because... Uh, for example, cows eat many times their body weight uh, in, in plant matter. Um, so all that inefficiency, only to use a small part of it for meat and leather, what if we could work additively and grow these materials from the cells themselves? And indeed, that's what we do at Modern Meadow. So we're developing the technology to grow animal products, to make them actually better, and to grow them directly from cells so that we can grow what we need. And we can do this without killing animals, and without having the um, same harm to the environment, much, much better effect on the environment. 
Now, an important point. We're not going for, innovate, uh, for imitation. Our goal uh, at Modern Meadow is not to make hamburger or hot dog or steak or to reproduce meat exactly as you know it. And uh, our focus, actually, our priority is materials. We're, we're focused on leather. And there, too, it's not to make, I can't believe it's not slaughtered leather. It's to make better materials, to find important design and performance improvements that really, really elevate these products. Because if you make them in a different way, you can make them better. Uh, and in fact, we're the only uh, biotech company, we're the only life sciences company that we know of that has a chief creative officer who is a world famous fashion designer uh, who sits and, and works alongside our chief technology officer. Because for us, design thinking uh, infuses everything we do. Uh, and it's not an afterthought. Uh, and it's important for us to come up with better products, not, not just the same products. Now, this idea of growing um, animal products in a better way is not a new one. It's been talked about as long as there's been uh, science around cell culture. Uh, and in fact, Ch Churchill uh, famously wrote about it in the 1930s. He, he, he said, uh, if you think about it, the way we farm our animals is an absurdity. It's very inefficient. And we should be able to, in the future, grow the products we need from the cells themselves. And he predicted that this would be a reality in 50 years. Now, Churchill has been right about a lot of things, and he's right about this too. He was just wrong about the time frame. It's taken time for the science to catch up with his vision. And the reason why, or, or some of the technologies that have enabled this to become a reality, are a lot of the advances in computation and in the enabling tools of biology. So in the last, uh, in the last 50 years, there's been huge advances in cell culture. In the last two decades, there's been huge advance, advances in tissue engineering, the ability to actually grow entire tissues, not just cells. And some of the things that underlie this are huge advances in, uh, in, in computation, of course. We all know about Moore's Law. Uh, Moore's Law allows the, uh, the cost of, of, of processing to, to, to be reduced by half uh, um, uh, every, every two years. Or rather, it allows you to put twice as many processors on a chip every two years. And now we have advances in biology that are going faster than Moore's Law. So the ability to sequence DNA, the cost of that in the last five years has dropped faster than Moore's Law. The ability to actually write DNA has gone faster than Moore's Law. And this translates into other processes in biology, like the ability to actually yield proteins uh, through fermentation uh, has gone up uh, significantly. Now these are, not, these are indirectly related to what we do, but they're the enabling technologies that allow us to take technologies that used to be the province of medicine. Because at the end of the day, when you have new technologies in, 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 in biology and, and, and price is not an issue, you go after the most valuable thing, which is human life. And, and so a lot of these technologies were initially deployed in medicine. But now, as costs come down, we can finally think about applying these things in consumer and industrial applications. And that is what we do. So we're focused on uh, leather first. We're focused on materials first as a company. We, we grow animal products broadly. We have a, a materials program. We have a food program. The reason why we're focused on material first is because if you think about it, it is the highest value density uh, product we can go after. If you take a look at a cow, for example, the fully processed uh, product that comes out of a cow, uh, leather per kilogram is a more valuable product uh, than, than meat is. And in fact, we're able to develop uh, types of leather that can target luxur luxury and fashion, uh, uh, high-end luxury and fashion applications. But we're also developing uh, foods as well. Um, and so our focus on materials, the way we think about it is that there's been a huge advance in materials since uh, as far back as, as civilization. If you think about it, we've defined civilization and the important eras in civilization and human history by the materials we have mastered. And it started with uh, our ability to master natural materials. So in the Stone Age, the, the, the main ingredients that we were able to, 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 to work with were things like leather and wood and shell and bone, et cetera. And then since then, we've been able to master alloys and metalworking. And, and then in the 20th century, there's been huge advances in plastics and uh, uh, semiconductors. And since uh, the discovery of DNA, there's been a, a biotechnology age. So we like to think of uh, the current age that we're in as really a biofabrication age, as a biomaterials age. And in fact, 
if the graduate were to be filmed today, uh, the one word would not be plastics, it would be biomaterials. So the process that we use to actually grow leather um, is we take cells from an animal, and this could be any animal. It could be a cow, an ostrich, a crocodile, you name it. And we can take the cells from the animal through a biopsy of its skin without harming the animal. And uh, we, we can exploit uh, natural variation, so to actually find the best performing cells from the best animals, the best kept animals and the, the healthiest animals. And once we've found the best cells, uh, we grow them in large quantities. So we expand the number of cells, and then we get these cells to uh, produce collagen, because collagen is the main protein building block of leather. So we're, we've developed ways of actually bioassembling uh, the cells uh, to have them produce collagen and to create sheets of material that we can grow together to create, essentially, uh, a form of hide. And this is hide that is identical uh, in, in, in protein composition to natural hide. So this is a real leather, except that it doesn't have hair on it, it doesn't have flesh on it, it doesn't have fat on it. So it's actually a lot cleaner to take it into the tanning process because you don't need to lime and delime it and remove the hair, flesh, and fat, which is really, really messy. And you can skip many parts of the tanning process, and you can use a much more benign chemistry when you tan these materials. And then we tan them, we finish them, and then we work with partners to make uh, fancy products. And um, this is a, 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 a movie that we uh, use to illustrate this process, where we show uh, the, you know, how, we, how we actually make the materials. It's more illustrative. It's the, the way we've been communicating this process to our partners. So let's take a look at the, the film, shall we? So to imagine the most perfect cow. But that's essentially our, our, our process. We, we reproduce the, the biological structure of leather uh, without killing the animal. Now, why is this interesting? Uh, this is interesting because it solves important problems for consumers and for brands. It addresses supply-demand problems. It addresses the fact that prices are going higher. Uh, it addresses issues of traceability and animal welfare. Um, and importantly, uh, if you're making leather goods, you waste about depending on the application, 20 to 50 to even 80, 85 percent of the material, of a fully finished material. So if you're making shoes, it's 20 percent. If you're making car seats, it's 50 percent of the material that you waste. And if you're making straps for the luxury watch industry, it can be as high as 85 percent of a very expensive material. And of course, leather is of variable quality. It's an agricultural good. And then most interestingly, if you're making something from leather, leather is a found object. You can only innovate in the tanning process. But if you could actually grow the leather with the end application in mind, you can come out, up with all kinds of design and performance improvements. So these are steps that we skip. Beam house operations, we don't need to do it. So all that hair, flesh, and fat, we, can, uh, we don't have to deal with. The irregular shapes of leather, it's not a problem for us because we can make them more reliable in, in quality, shape, and size. And then most interestingly, we can actually come up with better design and performance uh, properties. So we can grow it in different patterns and different shapes. We can control thickness. We can go for things like watermarking and translucency. And importantly, as you go from culturing, uh, from slaughtering to, to making something through a cultured process, it's much better in terms of land use, water use, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and, and energy efficiency. Now, we also have a food program. And there's a lot written about uh, what we do in, 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 the, in the press about our food program, even though that's less commercial. Um, and there, also, we like to think of it, of, of culturing in food as having a very long history. Because if you think about it, we've been culturing uh, and fermenting foods since all the way back to you know, beer, wine, cheese, yogurt. In fact, you cannot have a fun weekend without uh, something 
uh, consuming a food or a beverage that's been cultured or, or fermented. And we like to think of what we do, uh, culturing or fermenting meat, um, as being uh, just the next chapter. And so we've come up with a food product that illustrates this idea that you don't have to, if you're going to reinvent the process, you can come up with an entirely new product. And this is a product, it's a conceptual product, it's not commercial. We call it steak chips. Um, and it's a crunchy form of beef jerky that's made without killing an animal. It's nutritionally very high value. It's, it's a lot of protein, very little fat. It's, uh, it's delicious. It's very umami and savory. It's made from very high quality ingredients. All the ingredients here are natural, natural cells, no GMO, uh, grown in natural ingredients, and through a process that is very transparent. So unlike a slaughterhouse, this is a process that you can actually see uh, completely unfold in front of you. And in fact, we've had, um, I'm going to skip the process of how we make it, but essentially it's similar. You grow the cells, you, uh, and then there's a lot of chefing up to make our, our, our chip products. Um, and our vision is that in the future, leather and meat and these products will be brewed. Uh, they'll be made in, in uh, much like beer or, or wine in a setting that could be very open to the public rather than very hidden uh, from, from, uh, from the public. That the future actually will be more cultured. Um, now, I've brought some sample uh, steak chips. And, um, and I should say, we've had, at this point, a couple hundred people taste it. Uh, and, and they're all alive and well. Um, <laughs> Uh, this, is, this is not a commercial product. This is a, a version that we call 0 0.2, version 0 0.2. So last year, we had a version 0 0.1 that a lot of people tasted. And uh, um, at this point, I'm going to look for a few volunteers to come up uh, and to taste cultured steak chips. So how many of you would be interested in tasting cultured steak chips? Raise your hands. OK. All right. Excellent. So I'm going to need some volunteers. Uh, you there. Fantastic. Uh, you in the, in the red sweater, if you can make it out. Um, and then David, can we get David Rowan to come up here as well? Are you in shorts? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, we'll see. And then I'm going to ask also, if you don't mind, my friends from, uh, from Noma to come up. So Lars and Ariel, if you guys can come, to get a chef's pr uh, perspective. OK, so we've got three bags of cultured uh, steak chips. And uh, if you guys would be willing to open a bag and perhaps split a chip and, and share it with someone and uh, opine on how it tastes. Can we eat the bag? Uh, what is it? Can we eat the bag? Uh, the bag is not so edible. Okay. But it was lovingly prepared by uh, Francoise. So you can, you can try to eat the bag if you want. Max, you go first. I'm actually hungry. It's not, it's not a lot, but. It's not, it, it, you know, it, it's not necessarily going to fill you up, which is why we're doing this after lunch. Yes. So. It's a potato chip, but slightly browner. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you should share it with someone. Uh, does anybody want to share it? Anyone? He's looking for someone to share it. You pick someone to share it with. Uh, <laughs> it's quite meaty. Okay. It's yeah? like a thinner version of beef jerky. Yeah. Fantastic. Crunchy beef jerky. That's Nobody's what we're going so for. Uh, no, not, you know, not because of this. Yeah. It's delicious, but Thank we you. are running into Caleb's time. Oh, well, in that case. Or Do you have, like, closing words? Well, I would say that uh, what goes really well with, uh, with, with, with meat is vegetables. Okay. So that's a good segue. Can we thank Andres <laughs> and his new kind of meat? Thank you very much. <laughs>